Hi, I'm Falko Monsis uh, from the University of Bremen. And today I'm going to talk about the impact of synoptic events on Arctic ozone using data from the OMPSLP, ERA 5 model data, and the Mosaic Ship campaign. Um, to start off with the motivation, so synoptic events are large-scale meteorological events that strongly affect the weather, which makes them very interesting for weather forecasting. But due to the sparse coverage of data in the Arctic region, we still can't predict or analyze them that well in that area. So one approach to overcome this problem is the use of satellite data, due to the fact that we have a lot of good satellite products in that region. So the goal was then to analyze synoptic events with the satellite data in the Arctic region to improve their forecasting reliability. But um, what has ozone to do with all of it? Um, ozone is a dynamic tracer of troposphere and stratosphere interaction, and synoptic events strongly affect this region of the atmosphere. So we can use the ozone data to make statements about the synoptic events. So our goal was then to first investigate the connection between synoptic events and the ozone content, and to then maybe produce an automatic ozone diagnostic, which can make statements about cyclones just from satellite ozone data. So the data we are using were from the Mosaic Ship Expedition, which was the expedition that started in September 2019 to October 2020, with the goal to gather a lot of data in the Arctic region with radio sounds. Um, the satellite data we were using the OMPS LIMP profiler that you all heard a lot about in the last few days. And for the model data we are using the ERA-5 data because of the high spatial and temporal resolution. So, as I said, synoptic events are large-scale events, uh, what means they have a horizontal length for, uh, of at least 1,000 kilometers, which you can see in the white and the red box, where the characteristic horizontal length and the characteristic length of time of different meteorological events are plotted. And for example, as you can see, synoptic events last at, um, from a few hours to many days. So, examples for synoptic events are cyclones, so low-pressure areas, that we will look closer in this presentation, or anticyclones, so high pressure areas. And as I said, uh, they have a strong impact on the UTLS region, so the upper troposphere, lower stratosphere region, um, and therefore especially on the tropopause. So to give a brief overview about the tropopause, yeah, it's the tropopause is the boundary between the troposphere and the stratosphere, and it's not just a line, but a region. And it has no uniform definitions, but many different definitions. For example, the thermal topopause, which is defined by a change in the lapse rate of the temperature. But uh, this distinct change we don't often have in the Arctic region. So therefore, for this presentation, we use the dynamic topopause, which is defined by a threshold in the potential vorticity, which is just a measure for the tendency of rotation of an air parcel. And this is normally ranging from 1.6 to uh, 4 potential vorticity units. Um, due to the fact that the topopause uh, is a region, so 1.6 is just a lower topopause in this region, and 4 PVU is a higher um, topopause. And we are using the 4 PVU definition because it's easier to measure with the satellite data. And another important definition for this presentation is the ozonopause, which is um, an ozone topopause which is defined also by a threshold, but in the ozone volume mixing ratio. And this is normally 18 parts per billion, but we will look closer into that later in the presentation. So to start off with the analysis, um, here you can see a time high section of the ozone volume mixing ratio on the polar stem position from the ERA-5 data for a cyclone event that happened in the November 2019. So here the cyclone event happened, and you can see the influence from the cyclone, so the low pressure area on the topopause, so the topopause is lower in this case. So, um, yeah, then we are using the topopause as the as a measure for the synoptic event. So we can compare the topopause and the ozone as yeah a measure. So, if we look at the influence of the topopause on the ozone content, we can actually see that when the ozone uh, the topopause is lowered ozone gets sucked into the column, so the total ozone column increases. And this correlation is also in the other way around, so when the topopause is higher, ozone gets pushed out of the column, so the total ozone column decreases. Um, so there are two correlations uh, we can remember here. First, the negative correlation between the topopause high and the total ozone column, but also that ozone levels in this area of the atmosphere move along the topopause, which we will use later. Um, yeah, but the question still arises, how well can we see this correlation with real ozone data? And that's why we're looking at the three-month period of the OMPS LIMP data, 
and compared with the um, dynamic turbopause high of the ERA-5 data, which you can see here. Um, here we are actually using the sub-column from 10 to 20 kilometer, um, due to a reason that I will explain in the next slide. But if we first compare the two ozone data sets in red from the ERA-5 and the ohm pairs LIMP, we can see a relatively good um, qualitative agreement between these two data sets. But more importantly, we can see that the negative correlation also occurs for the real ozone data, so the satellite data. Um, also for a case where the turbopause is lowered and we have a higher subcolumn. And especially in these two cases where we can see that the turbopause is higher and we can see that the subcolumn is decreasing. So the next step was then to find a synoptic event we can analyze with the satellite data to produce an automatic ozone diagnostic, to find an approach for it. And uh, for this, oh, no, that is actually the next slide. Okay, okay, I was talking about, okay, as I said, why are we using the 10 to 20 kilometers? And this is due to the reason that we first wanted to investigate at which altitude uh, turbopause change has the most influence on the ozone content. And as um, expected, I would say, the most influence between the turbopause high change and the ozone content is an altitude from 10 to 20 kilometers, just due to the reason that the turbopause in the Arctic region is normally in that area or below that area, so there should be the highest influence. Um, if we look at how good this information is transported into higher altitudes of the atmosphere, we can see that till 30 kilometers, we still have a good correlation. But if we look into higher altitudes, we can see that this information of the topopause change is lost. Nevertheless, if we look at the near total ozone column from 10 to 60 kilometers, we can still have the negative correlation. So and now, as I said, we had to find a synoptic event we can analyze with the satellite data. And uh, therefore, we plotted every cyclone event that impacted the polar stern during the mosaic campaign. So every box in this plot is a cyclone event, but there are only two important things. So the width of the box is the lifetime of the cyclone, and the color of the plot is just the length of the cyclone. And what instantly catched our eye was this cyclone event in May 2020, which impacted the polar stern actually on three occasions. So we wanted to look first into the ERA-5 data on the polar stern position during this cyclone event, which you can see here on the left. Uh, matched to the movie on the right. So in the lower left plot, you can see the surface pressure on the polar stand position, and there you can see the three influences of the cyclone here, here, and here. And if we look at the first influence, we can see that for the turbopause high and the ozone content of the ERA-5, we can't really see a disturbance in that ozone field. But for the second and third occasion, we can definitely see the influence of the cyclone on the turbopause high and therefore also on the ozone content. And if we then look into the OMPS data, which are plotted as uh, small triangles, which you can barely see, but it's actually good because it's the same contour as the background, so it's good when you can't see them. And we can see that we also can see the influence of the turbopause change in the OMPS data. So, the next step was then to find an OMPS orbit that flies just above the cyclone, which you can use to look at the profiles of these um, orbits to analyze it. And this was actually this orbit that you can see at the right, where we looked into the data. And which you can see now on the left, where the x-axis is just the data point number of the uh, orbit. And if we look at the influence of the cyclone, which happened from the first measure point to the 15th measure point, we can see that we can yeah, see the influence of the cyclones actually in the OMPS limb data. We can see that the ozone levels till around 15 kilometers are lowering. So the question was still then, how can we use this information to produce a diagnostic um, with the OMPS limb data? And for this, we looked at the ozonopause. The only problem was that the 80 parts per billion ozonopause is just most of the time too low to be measured with the OMPS limb profiler, which you can see here. We can barely see the influence of the cyclone because we can't really look um, below eight kilometers. So we were trying different definitions that are at least a bit higher. And actually the best definition that suited our intention was the 250 parts per billion definition because it's low enough to get influenced by most cyclones, but still high enough to be, um, yeah, to be measured with the OMPS limb data. And we then thought about a high, this niveau has to sink below to be defined as a cyclone. And for this high, we choose the lowest high we can measure with our product, so nine kilometers. So 
as you can see here, the definition was if the 250 parts per billion ozone level, so the ozonopause, sinks below 9 kilometers and stays below 9 kilometers for at least five measure points, it is defined as a cyclone start. And if then rises again till above 9 kilometers, it is defined as the cyclone end. So if you use this approach for the cyclone that we just saw in the slides before, we can actually see that the cyclone borders gets calculated pretty well. And um, although the end of the cyclone is not calculated perfectly, we can see that the core of the cyclone, and so the strongest part, is within the calculated cyclone borders. So, and here's actually um, another case where you can see that we could track a cyclone over time, where we use three consecutive OMPS orbits to track one and the same cyclone with yeah, the three orbits. And you can see that we can calculate the borders for one and the same event over time if we have enough OMPS orbits. Um, I talked actually pretty fast, I think, because now I'm at the summary. <laughs> but um, yeah, here you can see the most important points, but then I can um, yeah, read them for you. So the interaction between the synoptic events and ozone in the Arctic, we can see that the ozone moves along the turbopause in this region of the atmosphere, and that there's a negative correlation between the total ozone column and the turbopause high change. And that the strongest influence of this change is in an altitude below 30 kilometers, as expected. And for the quality assessment of the satellite data we are using, we can definitely say that the OMPS LIMP data is suitable for the analysis of synoptic events in the Arctic region. And there's also a high agreement between the ERA-5 data and the OMPS LIMP data, what speaks for the use of the ERA-5 data as a first approach for the analysis of synoptic events, especially in the polar night. And for the diagnostics, we can see that the ozonopause as a first approach of the tracking parameter seems very promising. And uh, to give a short outlook, um, we definitely want to use MLS data because um, there are so many interesting events that happens during the polar night. And yeah, we also want to investigate them with satellite data. So this is yeah, also a thing we want to do. And as I said, um, this is just a first approach. So we still have to see how we account for non-cyclone related um, ozone change for example, the polar vortex. So we still want to improve this algorithm, for example, with an integrated um, ozone column as a second parameter. And last but not least, uh, we want to see if we can calculate the strength of a cyclone through the OMPS limb data. So if the ozonopause gets lowered more, the stronger the cyclone is. Yeah, thank you for your attention. Thank you.